This mystical continent is generally referred to as the motherland of humanity. Africa is rich in its natural and human resources, and its art is no exception, which is why we're looking to its art to gain a better understanding of its diverse and complex cultures. In this segment of Frame, we are at the University of Iowa's Museum of Arts Visual Classroom. And joining us to share her wisdom on African cultures is the curator of African and non-Western art, Catherine Hill. Catherine, welcome to Frame. Thank you. It's Thanks a pleasure so to be much. Here. It's a pleasure to have you. We have so much knowledge, and the topic is endless and fascinating. So, I'm going to let you guide us on the visual classroom tour. There's a lot to know about African art, and actually to know about the UIMA visual classroom specifically. What we're really focusing on in this space is targeting students and their relationships with professors. So how can professors, not only in the art history department, but we've had professors in the history department and you know, dealing with politics, dealing right. with language, right. and they're using the objects as a way to teach their students about their various topics. So right. when, for me as a kind of the curator of this space, mm -hmm. what I focus on is thinking about how can we take objects from our incredible collections here mm -hmm. at the University of Iowa Museum of Art and really make them serve the students and the professors in a way that's going to enrich their education. I think a lot of people aren't necessarily aware of how important African art and the field of African art is relative and uh, related to the University of Iowa. University of Iowa actually gave out the first PhD in African art. That is absolutely a fascinating factoid. You're in charge. What okay. are we going to do next? Can um, we look at some of the art? Yeah, we can look at a, a few pieces of art. Is that okay. what you I do? would love to. I love okay. the piece to your right. This one <laughs> yes. right here? A lot of people, when they think about African art, they think of masks. And this mm -hmm. is a magnific magnificent example. I've noticed that a lot of the students who come into the gallery space just say, what is that? You know, they <laughs> so just, dynamic. They want to know because there's so much happening here. You can see that there's a jaw with teeth in it. There's some horns here. There's more tusks here. Right. We've got some, um, you know, we could call them horns horns or antlers here. Right. There's also a chameleon figure along the top. Yes. And this is a mask that's from the Sanufo people who are living, this is West Africa, so okay. we're looking at Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso yes. area. And it's associated with um, a, an association called Poro, which has different levels. And depending on what level you are, you can, you know, there's different objects associated with it. And the fire spitter mask is one of the most powerful um, masks and it's used a lot of times to kind of it may be used as a, a policing kind of mask so to control oh. um, kind of strife in the community or difficulties mm -hmm. some people um, depending on how you think about it people would refer to something like witchcraft which isn't a term that I necessarily use but it's one that people are more familiar with so okay. thinking about sort of um, malevolent forces be okay. they um, kind of earthly so to speak or sure. more spiritual sure. in okay. the sense so these masks are really kind of powerful masks that are used to keep those things in check if that makes sense. Well, it, it's good at inciting fear. Yes. Well, and just having a look at it too, you have to picture, I mean, here we have it on a white plinth, you know, against white walls. And right. you have to envision that masks, you know, in different communities, they're very different. But the, one of the consistent things to think about is these objects were created to be performed. So they, mm -hmm. there was scent, there was mm -hmm. sound, you know, there was movement and costume that were linked up with these as well. In some ways, a, a female counterpart to the male masking. Um, the Dan culture has a lot of, or well, there's many Dan peoples, but there's mm -hmm. also a, a wide range of male masking traditions there. Um, but this is a female tradition, which is the Wakemi or Ladle. This is something that the female head of a community, there's sort of a, an element of competition in, in being the, the most kind of generous hostess. Oh. And she has this ladle which is thought to kind of embody um, a spirit in the way that the, the men's masks do, and also to embody the kind of the spirit of her generosity. And so what she does is there's kind of major ceremonies at certain times of year and she will have her wakemia ladle mm -hmm. and it becomes she she will dance through the streets carrying her wakemia ladle and she'll serve out you know whether it's rice or whether it's candy to the kids and and everybody in the streets and it's part of it is showing that she is a leader and she's one of the most generous hosts ah. in the community and there's also this idea you can see the kind of the physical uh, body of the spoon is the woman's body. So it uh, works on a more um, symbolic level as well as the yes. woman as the kind of creator of society. Mm -hmm. It's also, if you look at the features with the, uh, the kind of filed teeth and the, the high brows, 
and the complicated coiffure, those are also ideals of Dan Beauty. So you see oh. there's a lot of kind of things coming together here yes. to symbolize women and their mm -hmm. role in the community, but then also to actively function when the woman is kind of being generous amongst the members of the community. This piece is quite unique from a standpoint of a Westerner's viewpoint of it. Mm -hmm. It's not the most aesthetically beautiful piece, but in African culture, it has a different interpretation. Will you, sh you share with us Absolutely. exactly what that is? <laughs> this is actually one of my favorite objects for thinking about African art. It really introduces people to the idea of a different value system, different ways of appreciating objects that don't necessarily align with Western conceptions. So yes. um, in my experience, the idea of kind of the Western art is a lot of times this is the idea of beauty. It's mm -hmm. the, the most beautiful object is the best one or the most powerful. Right. And what's interesting to know about here, we're with the Bamana people in Mali. So again, okay. we're in West Africa. All right. And this is an object, as you can see, from from as you, you know, you, it struck you from an aesthetic perspective <laughs> as not being very attractive. Right. Uh, but this is actually one of the most powerful objects and it's mm. involved with kind of um, men's associations who are, um, one of their roles is kind of controlling and harnessing powerful forces. And how this is created is there's an, kind of an armature inside of, sometimes it's made using bamboo and cotton and then different things are piled onto it. And mm. we actually couldn't tell you the specific ingredients of it because part of that is the information of the person who is creating it. He has a recipe, so to speak, um, that he, he knows that certain things need to be brought together in this boli, this kind of altar, um, to, to harness those powerful sources. So it may include things like oh. mud, dung, animal bones, sometimes pieces of you know uh, metal. There's all kinds of things. And then in the context of using it as an altar, then um, sacrifices might be made in terms of you know a chicken so there might be some mm. chickens blood or goats blood mm -hmm. mixed into it as well and mm. this is something that through accumulation mm -hmm. it becomes more and more powerful so despite the fact that ah. we don't necessarily you know come to it you and I haven't come to it today and thought oh that's striking right. beautiful right <laughs> but what we understand is that within its particular context and value system this is one of the most powerful objects and I I think that's really important for understanding the intersections between different uh, ways of thinking about art, art objects, cultural objects, and sure. their power. Please tell us about the symbolism involved in the creation of this and something that is unique to the culture that you don't really think about in a Western setting. Absolutely. This is something that I, I think is a good example of thinking about the different roles of the artist. So mm -hmm. a lot of time in more recent Western culture anyway, there's this emphasis on the idea of the individual artist as genius. You know, we look at a painting, we say, who made this? As though it's always a single yes. individual and he's he or she is responsible for coming up with that you know, original idea. And that's something that isn't always the case in different African cultures. And this Nkitsi figure, this is um, from the Congo culture in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And what's so really interesting to me in terms of this discussion that we've mm -hmm. been having is that the idea is actually, this is created by at least two individuals. So there's a carver who actually carves the object to begin with, but then there's a ritual specialist who activates it, so to speak. Um, oh. And so without those to people, this sculpture in and of itself before it's activated by the ritual specialist mm -hmm. is sort of neither here nor there, it's just a sculpture. In this case, it's actually the Nganga or the, the ritual specialist who is doing, by this standard, sort of the most important work. Uh -huh. But if you were coming at it from a kind of a Western fine arts tradition perspective, we would expect, well, the sculptor, who, what was his name, you know? Right. And so it's interesting to think about those different roles. Please explain this gorgeous headdress to us. Catherine. Well, this is a really unique piece because as we mentioned looking at some of the other pieces, mm -hmm. in the majority of African cultures across the African continent, it's the men who wear and dance the masks. Yes. But in this case, we're looking at a mask that was created for either the Gola or the Vai people in Sierra Leone, but it's also part of a wider tradition of the Mende people of Sierra Leone too. Okay. And this is a mask that is associated with the Sande Society, which is an association which 
essentially teaches young women about how about their roles and how to be productive members of society. So, and this mask is is danced by women in a relationship with that because what ends up happening when young women reach a certain age, mm -hmm. they leave the community and they kind of go into a camp together, and that's mm -hmm. where they're educated about their roles. Sometimes they may learn about kind of um, healing through herbal um, ingredients mm. or history of their community so it becomes a kind of a way for the female mentors to pass the information down to the young women and part of it, it comes that's sort of related to this is the idea of ideals of female behavior but also of female beauty and these yeah. are things that are all kind of played out in these masks so these young women go to this camp and they go through these different phases and then when they return to the community they're accompanied by a dance or who wears this mask. And so when you look at it, you can start to understand some of those concepts. So for yes. example, the kind of rich, dark, oiled color of the skin, that's something that for the goal of the Vi, the Mende who um, have this Sandy society is an ideal of female beauty. We mm -hmm. also see that on the back here, there's the sort of uh, ring. One of the ideals of female beauty is to be more robust, to be more rotund. This mask, as you can see, they have these elaborate coiffures um, mm -hmm. and that's something that is part of you know the, the the ideal of female beauty but it also may in some cases make reference to kind of sometimes there's kind of a floral element to it or, or mm -hmm. kind of looked like um, designs from the forest so to speak so they may make reference to kind of particular histories and it's a way of transferring knowledge between different generations as well. But in this case we actually know the name of the artist, it was Lansana Ngumois and uh -huh. it was created around 1915 and we know this because it, the, this mask is actually documented in field photographs and Lansana Ngumoy was a very famous a kind of itinerant artist who went around and um, carved in different areas. So that's yeah. something that's really unique in the fields um, of African art, kind of historical African art, to be able to know the artist's name and also to be able to bring some of that history together is, is really sure. unique. I hope that what people will do is have a chance to come down and really start to think about it and ask questions because that's part of the excitement. I agree with you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you for tuning in to Frame. Frame is sponsored by Allegra, Click Marketing Solutions, Dial Folio Jewelry.